Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today for a briefing called States of Despair, Understanding Declining Life Expectancy in the United States. My name is Sarah Dash. I'm President and CEO of the Alliance for Health Policy. And for those who aren't familiar with the Alliance, we're a nonpartisan organization that's dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. So we thank you all for being here today to better understand this issue. Uh, hello as well, if you're following on Twitter, um, using the hashtag AllHealthLive, um, and um, folks can feel free to submit questions via Twitter and they'll be brought up here. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank the Commonwealth Fund for its support of this briefing. Um, so the terms deaths of despair, deaths from suicide, alcohol, and drug abuse is a, a relatively new term. Uh, however, it's a complex term uh, with a lot of underlying issues. Um, and today, we're, we hope to help unpack this term and the underlying trends and understand better how deaths of despair relate to um, trends in declining life expectancy in the United States. We're also um, going to highlight the development of state and federal policy solutions to address these trends. You're going to hear from five excellent speakers, and I know there are only four of them up here right now. We're waiting on the fifth, um, who has uh, had a delayed flight. So if anyone does transportation policy as well, feel free to chime in. Um, but he should be here momentarily. Uh, and uh, so, so that's why we're gonna get started. So um, our speakers are each bringing um, a very different perspective to this issue, and we're really grateful to have them shed light on this critical topic. Um, I'm not gonna be able to do their background justice in just the short time that I have, so please do um, check your packets for their bios with more extensive um, information. Um, I'll briefly introduce them and then we'll get started. So um, joining us today, um, to my left we have David Radley. David is a senior scientist for the Commonwealth Fund's Tracking Health System Performance Program. He and his team develop analyses on healthcare system performance and related insurance and healthcare system market structure analyses. He co-authored the 2018 State Scorecard on Health System Performance, and we're grateful that he's going to help us explain the methods behind that report and what it showed. Next, we'll have Marvin Figueroa. Marvin is Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, I'm sorry, Health and Human Resources for Governor Ralph Northam in Virginia. Prior to his appointment, he served for seven years as senior policy advisor for Senator Mark Warner, and I understand um, was also a college counselor at some point in the past, so um, has perhaps helped people through um, some challenging times in their lives. Um, Marvin is going to provide some on-the-ground perspective on these trends and what is going on in Virginia. Uh, following Marvin, um, should he arrive um, in time, uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Joe Thompson, who is going to provide uh, another state perspective on deaths of despair. Um, Joe is president and CEO of the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement, and he's responsible for developing research activities, health policy, and collaborative programs that promote better health and health care in Arkansas. Uh, next, we'll hear from Richard McKeon, who is chief for the suicide prevention branch in the center for Mental Health Services of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. Richard is going to provide insight into SAMHSA's purview over issues related to deaths of despair, as well as their suicide prevention efforts. Finally, we'll hear from Anand Parikh, who is the Chief Medical Advisor of the Bipartisan Policy Center. And prior to joining BPC, he completed over a decade of service at the Department of Health and Human Services. We're thankful that he can use his expertise to provide some summary remarks and he will draw on some of his work uh, from the article Towards the United States of Health that looks at the global burden of disease across state healthcare systems. So with that, I am going to turn it over to David Radley to kick off the conversation. Thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Uh, thanks, Sarah, and thanks to the Alliance for uh, putting this meeting together today. And um, I, I think it's an important topic, and I'm happy to sort of lay out some high-level data, just to sort of lay, do some context setting for you, and then the experts on the panel that really sort of know the issues a little bit deeper than I do will we'll dig in. Um, but anyway, my name is David Radley. Uh, as Sarah said, I'm a senior scientist at the Commonwealth Fund and a senior study director with Westat. Um, and I'm responsible for uh, the Commonwealth Fund's Health Systems Scorecard uh, reporting series. So today I'm gonna be presenting data from our most recent state scorecard, which came out in May, 
Um, and also from a blog post that we recently published on the fund's website just a couple of weeks ago that takes a deeper look at uh, deaths from despair. This is uh, deaths of despair is a measure that we included in our, our 2018 state scorecard. Um, and, and the blog post just digs a little deeper on that particular measure. Um, the data that I have that I'll be presenting today, um, don't get too caught up if you don't see all of the numbers on, if you can't keep up with the numbers on the screen. You have the data, it's in your packet. There's a, the blog post has a table in the back and all of the data that I'm gonna be talking about you have in front of you. So if you get lost, don't worry, you have, you have, you have the material. Um, also, uh, so the uh, scorecard, the decimal square measure is sort of part of our scorecard reporting series. We've been doing the series for about 10 years, um, and the formula has really stayed about the same over those 10 years. Um, we look at 30 to 40 performance measures spread across five dimensions of care. We look at healthcare access, healthcare quality, uh, efficiency, um, uh, healthcare equity within states, and then um, population health outcomes. Um, we, we started the series with a national report that basically looked at U.S. averages compared to international benchmarks, but we've grown the series to look at state and even local level data, um, and even uh, a couple of scorecards looked at special populations of interest. But today we're going to focus on just one measure, um, the deaths from despair. So deaths from despair isn't a clinical term per se. It was that the term was actually coined by, a, a, by two economists from Princeton a few years ago um, in some work they were doing to look at health outcomes associated with sort of broad um, economic and social trends. Um, when we're talking about deaths from despair, we're really talking about a composite of deaths from, from alcohol, suicide, and drug overdose. So with suicide, these are basically any death that, that occurs because of, of self-injury. And actually can include, in our definition, can include um, uh, intentional drug overdoses if somebody you know, took a, a drugs with the intention of, of killing themselves, if there was some sign that that was the case. Um, Alcohol-related alcohol deaths are basically deaths uh, that result from some sort of liver disease, that result from um, uh, you know, uh, alcohol use. And then I think what we're most interested in today, at least, is deaths from drug overdose. So in, in this definition that we're going to be talking about today, we're, we're talking about uh, drug overdoses that include opioid deaths, but that aren't limited to opioid deaths. It, this definition can also include um, deaths from you know, adverse drug events, uh, from prescription or even over-the-counter drugs. There we go. So just for a little bit of context setting, um, if we look back over the last 10 years or so, um, deaths from despair has been a leading cause of deaths to be sure, but still far few people in our country are killed each year by, uh, de from deaths from despair than are killed from heart, you know, heart failure or cancer. Um, what's unique about this deaths of despair measure is it's that it's the only leading cause of death that's actually increased in the last 10 years. So deaths from heart disease are down, deaths from cancer are down, stroke, everything's down, all these major, you know, deaths tied to a lot of these major chronic diseases are all trending downwards, which is of course what we would hope from our healthcare system, but deaths of despair are going up, and they're actually going up a lot. And in this chart, you can sort of see exactly, you sort of can see that increase a little bit better. From 2005 to 2016, deaths from despair rose 50%, over 50% nationally. Um, what's really driving that is a huge increase in deaths from, from drug overdose. So drug-related deaths are up, they've more than doubled in the last decade, um, and deaths from drug overdose have far surpassed um, suicide and, and alcohol use as the leading contributor to sort of this composite of deaths of despair. And we're going to focus on opioid deaths, and it's certainly that's the topic of the day, rightfully, it deserves a lot of attention. But don't lose sight of the fact that suicides and alcohol deaths are still up you know, over 20% in the last 10 years. I mean, these are still big increases, and these are still important topics that, that, that deserve attention. Well, let's take a look at what's going on across states. You know, we, these national trends are concerning, but it doesn't really hit home until we're thinking about what's going on uh, across states. So if we go back to 2005, we're looking again at the, the composite measure of deaths from despair. If we go back to 2005, not a single, st not a single state had an overall deaths of despair uh, mortality rate higher than, than 50 deaths per 100,000 individuals. And, and 26 states plus D.C. were all under 30 deaths per, per uh, 100,000 population. By 2016, the map looks quite different. By 2016, only one state, which is Nebraska, was under 30 deaths per 100,000. And, and 
the whole country has shifted. And now by, by 2016, uh, 18 states plus DC, so 19 total, were up over 50 deaths per 100,000 individuals. West Virginia's ha fared far worse than any other state. Uh, their uh, deaths of despair rates up over um, 80 per 100,000 now. And here we can sort of get a sense for so just, just how sort of concerning that the trend in West Virginia is. So what I've done here is I've arrayed each of the gray dots is the state rate in, in overall deaths from despair for the year that's, that's indicated across the bottom. So you can sort of see the full range as a distribution for the states. And if you go back to 2005, West Virginia was a little, just a little bit higher than, than, than the national average in this overall composite of deaths from despair. Um, through 2009, through, you know, through 2010, there was sort of a steady increase, a little bit of, a, an, of, an, of an anomaly in 2009. But then from 2012 through 2016, and with a real inflection right around 2014, you can see just how steep that, that increase in West Virginia in deaths from despair is. And when we look at what's causing it, it really is, it's drug overdoses. So in this chart, we're looking, I'm comparing Nebraska and West Virginia. These are the states with the lowest and highest rates of deaths from despair um, in 2016. Uh, when we look at Nebraska, there was sort of a modest increase between 2005 and 2016 for each of the components of deaths of despair. But for West Virginia, we see you know, a modest increase in alcohol deaths, a modest increase in suicide deaths, but an absolutely staggering increase in drug overdose deaths, which of course is driving the over overall composite. So just a quick summary, deaths from despair are up in every state, they're up nationally, the trends are concerning. Um, drug overdose, deaths associated with drug overdose are the primary contributor to that, and, and, and even though 10 years back they were the smallest contributor to the overall composite in deaths of despair, by 2016, now they're by far the leading contributor. Um, state experiences are very different. Uh, there's m m much different things going on, and, and it's a problem everywhere, but different states are being impacted much differently uh, by this. And so, the, the, other, the other panelists will talk a lot about the policy implications, but at a very high level, I think this, we sort of have an opportunity to be thinking about um, improving access to opioid reversal medications. Um, I think there's an opportunity to be more proactive with opioid prescribing guidelines and, 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 and in fact, limiting opioid uh, prescribing rates. Um, and there's, of course, uh, opportunities to enhance people's access to mental health care services and to encourage um, uh, care delivery models that integrate behavioral and, and medical care into one model. Um, that's it for me. Just a real quick shout out to Susan Hayes, who's in the audience, who is actually the, the, the lead author on the blog post you have, and to Doug McCarthy, another one of our fun colleagues, um, who's done a lot of work on this topic with us. Thank you. That was a pretty good segue. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marvin Figueroa. I'm the Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Resources for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, but before I became Secretary, I spent seven years working for Senator Mark Warner. Um, so in large part, this feels like somewhat of a homecoming. Um, so I really want to thank the Alliance for Health Policy team for welcoming me, and Sarah in particular, for, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to start off my segment by showing you this graph. It's a health opportunity index. It was put together by the Department of Health in Virginia, and it, it's a composite of about 13 indices uh, that takes into account about, well, it takes into account 13 social determinants of health. So it's everything from education, food insecurity, job participation, income inequality. And the case that I want to make today is that when you think about death of, uh, death of, of these are more death of disparity. Um, I will show you maps later on where you can see how they track each other, but in large part, the result, what has resulted in these deaths of despair is exactly the disparity that we see across the Commonwealth. And I want to particularly bring your attention to the blue and the pink. Nonetheless, understanding the factors responsible for recent mort mortality trends is important for us to address the possible health crisis and also think through what are the underlying causes. So just a slightly different definition. When we think about death of despair in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we're looking at a particular population. That's what I will focus on today. It tends to be white, non-Hispanic, 25 to 54 years old, and the stress-related conditions that Dr. Radley mentioned are the same. So unintentional drug overdoses, suicides, alcoholic liver disease, and alcohol poisoning. 
So if we take, say, 1995, or 1992 into 1995, and we take 2010 to 2014, and then look at the percent increase in mortality rates, there are a couple of things that we will observe. Death rates from unintentional drug overdoses increased by 331%. Death rates from alcoholic liver diseases increased by 37%, and the suicide rate increased by 29%. And not on the graph, but kind of worth, notice, worth noting is that uh, 20 conditions are responsible for the increase in mortality rates have to do with organ, disease, organ diseases. So everything from vital hepatitis to heart diseases, many of which have a potential link to substance abuse and other trauma. But these deaths are not evenly distributed in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Remember that Health Opportunity Index? The highest stress-related mortality rates are in Southwest, our West Central, which borders Kentucky and West Virginia, and our South Side. These populations have the lowest and second lowest medium household income, highest unemployment rate, and more than one in four children live in poverty. Taking a deeper view of things, the sharp increase happened in, is of 262%, 245%, 215% in Wise County, Buchanan County, and Dickinson County. Thinking about social determinants of health, in Wise County, 49% of adults graduate from high school. In Buchanan, only 9% of the population has a bachelor's degree. 31% of the children there live in poverty. If you look at Eastern Virginia, it had the largest proportional increase in these type of deaths lowest percentage of, of high school graduates, largest shortage of mental health professionals, and the second, second highest unemployment rate in the Commonwealth. And what do you know? What do you see? The rates of the fatal prescription opioid overdoses tend to happen in those locations as well. This is excluding fentanyl. This is including fentanyl. What we see from the federal government these days is that a reaction to this. So we have a number of different, different grants that have been awarded to the states. I apologize for all the text, but the biggest takeaway here is that because of the opioid crisis, we are receiving more financial resources to be able to combat this issue. But the challenge for states is how do you look at opioids and look at substance abuse and try to create a system or infrastructure that responds to addiction regardless of the substance. For us, the way ahead means that we have to move away from the immediate response to a crisis, which is often to just react, and more look at it, the systematic approaches to be able to address this issue. I'm gonna, in my, the time that I have remaining, I'm gonna focus on four, uh, four topics, four, four topics uh, in particular. One is Virginia has, a, has a, what we call community service boards, and it's in the code of Virginia, and the responsibility is to provide intellectual disability, mental health, and substance use disorder, services either directly or through contracts with private providers. We have about 40 CSBs scattered across the Commonwealth. And what you will find is that depending on what CSBs you're in, you will see different quality and different types of services. So if you've seen one CSB, we say you have seen one CSB. Um, part of our strategy to transform a mental, health, a mental health system is to integrate behavioral health and, and primary care, emphasize population health and awareness, excellence in behavioral health care, and also sustain strategic investment in community service and supports, what we call Step Virginia. So what you will see on the, on the right-hand column um, is kind of the, what we're building towards. So we are making strategic investments to make sure that regardless of where you are in the Commonwealth, you'll be able to receive these, these services. Secondly, we've taken a, a closer view on our Medicaid population and working with the American Society of Addiction Medicine have created a benefit that we call ARTS. And ARTS encompasses evidence-based services that we know will, are, are useful for individuals who, are, who have SUDs. So that's everything, that is a full spectrum of addiction and treatment services that includes residential treatment, case management, peer recovery counseling, and most importantly, Demonstrating the commitment that the General Assembly and the governor have made is that we are also, we also increase, increase um, reimbursement rates for behavioral health and mental health services. The result is that we have seen treatment rates increase. We have seen the number of members receiving uh, pharmacotherapy for opioid use disorder increase by 34%. And we also have more practitioners uh, able to provide, provide services. Here's kind of a, a graphic of, of the impact that we've seen. So this is before ARTS, this is after. 
finally, trying to bridge the gap between our uh, public safety secretariat and our health and human resources secretariat, we form an executive leadership team that has focused on, that brings together the secretariats to kind of combat substance abuse writ large. Here are some of the initiatives that we have going on. So everything from how do you get justice involved interventions, to treatment, to prevention, to supply prevention and harm reduction. And we can talk about that a little later during the Q&A. And then finally, we're focusing on adverse childhood experiences. One, most of the time when we serve with these individuals, we acknowledge that there are different issues that they've gone through that have caused traumatic stress, that have manifested themselves in some form of abuse. And the goal of the, of, of the, the governor's goal at this point is to try to figure out how do you include trauma-informed counseling in, in, in education and also in healthcare. We also have to think through the fact that a lot of these individuals, in particular those regions where we've seen these higher mortality rates, that they have children sometimes. And what do we do to ensure that the children also don't become substance use abusers? We have Medicaid expansion in Virginia, and so mo more people will have access to the arts program. I'm just including that to, to talk a little bit about, to put that as a, a, a post we could talk about later. And then these are the challenges. And it all has to do about funding most of the time, but also what are the changes that we can make because of this increased funding that will allow us to better serve these individuals where they present and provide the right care at the right time. And then finally, this is a note that we receive um, uh, from one of our constituents. So less addictive drugs. We need less addictive drugs. People are committing suicide because of drugs, and they are getting diseases because of drugs. So our children are watching. Thank you. Thank you. Marvin, before we go on, I just want to ask, um, could you talk a little bit more about the impact of fentanyl on the death rates you showed slides with and, and without? And um, just wondering, you know, there's been some talk about, you know, that being the driver of some of the, the deaths. And of course, if anyone else wants to chime in, but just wanted to yeah. ask you what's going on there. Well, what we observe is that it all depends on where, what locality you're in. So depending on the locality, you will see either it, the biggest driver being fentanyl, you have other places where it's heroin, and other places where it's methamphetamines. So again, the, the biggest takeaway is a drug will always find some, will always be different depending, well, let's start over. Depending, if you are a substance abuser, you will find a drug to abuse. And so we have to figure out not necessarily how to react to the drug itself, uh, but reacting to the underlying causes that are causing that, that, that that the result in an individual seeking that drug. I'll be more articulate next time. Oh, that's great. All right, I think next we have Dr. Joe Thompson. Thanks great. for being here. Great. Thank you for the invitation to the Alliance and support from the Commonwealth Fund and, and to my fellow presenters, honored to be on the platform here with you and to all of you for being here today. Uh, by way of background, just for information, uh, I'm a physician. I lead the state's unofficial health policy center uh, for 10 years, I served as the lead cabinet advisor to former Republican Governor Beebe and former Democratic Governor, uh, sorry, Huckabee, Republican Governor Huckabee and Democratic Governor Beebe. Uh, so these issues have emerged over the last decade and, and, and I have had upfront and, and important kind of opportunities to see the, the death and despair that we're talking about today. I'll start by just one of the fundamental outcomes that I'm gonna share with you, zip code matters. Uh, the deaths of despair are concentrated in areas of our nation and in areas within our states, which despair is not just about mental health depression, it's other opportunities, it's the erosion of the community fabric, it is the outmigration of individuals from small cities in rural America uh, that is leaving a fabric of despair that then subjects individuals to turning to drugs or alcohol or other escape mechanisms that we're talking about here today. Uh, so, so let me give you a state-specific perspective, and I have to start. Arkansas is always, or has always been, in the bottom two or three of states' health rankings. Uh, we compete with Mississippi. Anybody here from Mississippi and Louisiana? Uh, we're there with you. Uh, we were one of the few states that, in 2014, took the Affordable Care Act opportunity and expanded Medicaid, the only southern state uh, that expanded Medicaid. And just to share with you, it, it does make a difference. It's not often that within a year. Uh, you can see graphical displays of, that are at state's boundaries for the dramatic reduction in uninsured that we had. Uh, to, specific to this topic, importantly, it forced our insurance carriers to cover mental health and substance abuse, which most of them did not do 
uh, prior to 2014. Uh, as a point of advertising, again, uh, our rates, because of the way that we did it through a Medicaid large purchase in the small individual marketplace, have been lower uh, than other states' experiences, and our competition has increased. We've gone from one carrier statewide to now we have three carriers statewide and the increase in choice. Uh, so we have the financial mechanism in place, but we still have the challenges of the topic that's on the table today uh, for our deaths of despair. This is for the Institute for Health, uh, Care, Health Metrics and Evaluation from the University of Washington. These are mortality statistics. The darker red color are where mortality rates per 100,000 all-cause are greater. And you can see in areas of our nation that have economic depression, in rural areas, in areas that have not benefited uh, from some of the expansion and, and some of the uh, technology advances of the coast or of our larger cities, you have significantly higher mortality rates. Uh, along the lower Mississippi uh, River Delta, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, we have statistics that are rival third world countries for the entire state on virtually every health statistic. And unfortunately, in the federal government, when you look at health statistics, the Mississippi River is used to divide the eastern region and the western region so that you never really see how bad it is on either side of the Mississippi River um, because those health statistics are diluted uh, by higher... Uh, 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 functioning cities uh, to the east and west. Uh, it's focused in poverty. Uh, the median household income, if you line all the households in Arkansas up, is $44,000 a year. Uh, that includes the Waltons, which are some of the richest individuals uh, in the country. Uh, so you can get an idea. Here in Maryland, it's about $87,000 a year. Uh, if you go out into those rural areas of the state, and it's not just Arkansas that has these rural challenges, it's the entire nation. Uh, you have a significant economic depression, and many of those families lost much of their net worth during the recession a decade ago, and they have not regained it. So these are stimulus for individuals turning to uh, substances of abuse and, and the drugs that we're talking about. Um, you already saw this. We are one that is experiencing a higher death rate, although not yet uh, uh, to the extent of Kentucky. Uh, however, we are the second highest prescribing state in the nation with more than one prescription per individual uh, each year of opioids. Uh, we have attacked this, and I'll share with you what we are doing well, what we are trying to do better, and what I believe we have yet to do, uh, and I think this is a nationwide call. Uh, we have established and have one of the more robust prescription drug monitoring programs. Uh, we have required physicians to access the PDMP prior to prescribing a Schedule II or a Schedule III narcotic. Uh, we have active surveillance of the PDMP. The health department has mailed out letters to providers that are outside of the norm uh, for their practice uh, characteristics. We have statewide and local drug take-back programs. We have a significant level of effort under public health outreach or public outreach and education. Uh, we have payer engagement strategies on both the public and the private side. Our state and public school employees plan, the largest health insurance plan in the state, limited nascent or first-time narcotic prescriptions to seven days uh, in an attempt to try to uh, avoid a longer-term exposure that leads to addiction. Our College of Pharmacy is one of the leading uh, investigatory units in the nation supplying the CDC with much of their how long it takes you to get addicted, which is between three and five days of, of consumption. Our Medicaid program has limited uh, the morphine milliequivalents that are prescribed on nascent prescriptions and also uh, required lock-in to a single pharmacy for Medicaid paid uh, drugs. Uh, so I think we're moving on the public and the private side. This is an example. On your right are the Medicaid uh, bill rates for beneficiaries. On the left, where the commercial sector is lagging, you see far higher consumption of opioids uh, on the commercial sector, some four to five-fold higher. Uh, on the adult commercial compared to the adult Medicaid program. Uh, we've got new and promising interventions underway with physician engagement. Our medical board has actually now put a requirement that if you're over the CDC recommended, recommended morphine milliequivalents, you must have in the patient's chart a re rationale for that and a treatment strategy to try to lower that level of prescribing, uh, as well as other review uh, activities at the medical board. The employee assistance programs, I think every employer, large employer and moderate size employer, has an employee assistance program. I think this is an area we are not actively utilizing. We have tens of thousands of individuals currently addicted and dependent upon narcotics. We have a number of efforts going to turn off the supply, 
But if we don't have the mental health treatment and the uh, addiction uh, recovery efforts in place, we're going to drive people to more illicit drug use, which we have yet to experience in a significant way as have other states, I think, on either coast. A new effort, uh, crisis stabilization units, these are efforts uh, at four counties within our state to put a medical three-day way station between individuals who are picked up by the police and on their way to jail to try to stabilize them from a mental health perspective or potential substance abuse issue uh, rather than incarcerating them and taking them down a path that we know leads to recidivism and poor health outcomes. Uh, so these are efforts going forward. I think we have some gaps and some policy interventions that are still needed. We need coordination uh, within the state across payers. I mentioned the commercial side and the Medicaid side, but they need to get together to reinforce this consistent messaging to providers. We need coordination between states. Uh, Missouri does not participate with the PDMP, and so our residents that go across, we lose line of sight uh, when individuals on the northern border of Arkansas go into the southern border of Mississippi. Medicaid, although the expansion is required to cover substance abuse, traditional Medicaid in our state and in many other states does not cover substance abuse as a covered benefit. Uh, so I think that's a challenge. And buprenorphine uh, availability uh, uh, is, is limited. I think there are waivers uh, under my DEA card that we have too few physicians that have sought to be able to do substance abuse uh, treatment. Uh, and the barriers to the number of individuals, even if I have a waiver that I'm able to care for, it's not gonna match up with the demand that we have in, in our population. Uh, so with that, let me close, look forward to questions and answers. There are good things going on, there are challenges going on, zip code matters, and I think we need to go upstream, not just think about the supply line, but also think about the treatment line for individuals that are addicted and in need. Thank you. Where are we going now? Thank you. Dr. McKeon. Well, uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you to talk about this important issue. Is that on? Ah, that's better. Okay. It's an honor to be here with you to talk about this important issue of deaths of despair, which SAMHSA um, uh, has uh, really tried to focus on. In fact, we invited uh, Case and Deaton uh, to SAMHSA and arranged uh, involvement with uh, and I am AIAA, NIDA, HRSA, VA, DOD, so that we could all talk together about this important issue because of the increases. And that, and while SAMHSA has been heavily engaged in the response to the opioid crisis under the leadership of our Assistant Secretary, uh, Eleanor McCants Katz, who is an addiction psychiatrist, um, I'm going to focus with you on the issue of suicide. Um, and only in, it's only in the last couple of years that the deaths from opioids have overtaken the deaths by suicide. But suicide is also increasing in an alarming manner. So there are nearly 45,000 people lost to suicide in the United States in 2016, the last year for which we had data. And of, of, of equal concern, Suicide has increased in 49 of the 50 states. Only Nevada has not seen an increase, and Nevada had one of the highest rates of suicide uh, beforehand, and it's not really gone down. More than half of all states have seen more than a 30% increase in suicide. So that is really uh, important. And while mental health conditions play a very important role, those with serious mental illness, youth with serious emotional disturbance have much higher rates of suicide than others. Suicide is complex, and there are multiple factors that are involved, including uh, certainly substance abuse, economic uh, uh, stresses, legal, et cetera, a wide range. Anything that causes stress and distress um, and human misery may play a role in suicide. So this shows you the, uh, the data um, on the increases um, in suicide um, across the states. And within those states, as has been mentioned, there is a uh, clustering of, of where the increases have been most stark in many, of our, uh, in many of our rural communities that are seeing increases both in opioids as well as in suicide. And I should mention that sometimes it is hard to know whether a death was a suicide or accidental overdose. I've now been to three different states where I've been told, anecdotally, you know, about encountering people who, upon being uh, resuscitated with Narcan, said, I wish you hadn't brought me back. 
whether that was a suicide attempt or whether it was a person so despairing they didn't care whether they lived or died, it, it may be impossible to know. Suicide is the leading cause of death, the second leading cause of death among all Americans from age 10 until age 39, okay? And then from the, uh, it, as you see, it goes to fourth and uh, for age 40 to 49 and then to seventh for 50, 59. It's not because suicide's gone down. In fact, the numbers and the rates go up then, but other causes of death accelerate during those age groups at a greater rate. But the U.S. D has been working hard on this issue. We do have a national strategy for suicide prevention that was released by the Action Alliance and the Surgeon General uh, several years ago. SAMHSA released a report earlier this year that's, however, that said, we weren't able to identify a single state that was implementing everything that we know about effective suicide prevention. We know more than we've ever known before about suicide prevention. We're doing more than we've ever done before, but there's a lot more we need to do. This is a slide from NIMH. But you can't fix what you can't measure. And most US healthcare systems don't track suicide related outcomes. Um, we think that this is an important thing to be encouraging uh, because within the healthcare system is one, but not the only important way that we can reach people to prevent their suicide. But there are healthcare systems that are doing this. One that has attracted a lot of attention is the Henry Ford healthcare system and their perfect depression. Uh, care which had a zero suicide a goal as part of it. They showed it was possible in a healthcare system by taking a systematic approach to drive down the number of deaths by suicide of people under their care. Um, and uh, that data has been published. This has been submitted for publication. This is uh, Centerstone, one of the nation's largest uh, private nonprofit uh, community mental health centers. They also have found similarly that they have been able to decrease this. So for this reason, SAMHSA, as well as several other federal agencies have been supporting the Zero Suicide Initiative. Congress has expanded the funding for that. We just made 14 uh, awards, including to five new states, uh, just about a month ago. SAMHSA has had a large youth suicide prevention effort going back a number of years. Uh, um, the Garrett Lee Smith uh, Youth Suicide Initiative, all 50 states have received one of these grants since they were initiated in 2005. What we found is that counties that were implementing GLS-funded activities had lower suicide rates than match for youth from, than matched counties that were not. But the effect faded after a year, which spoke, speaks to the importance of finding ways to sue, sustain um, and build into the foundation of states, communities, tribes, suicide prevention efforts if we want to be able to combat suicide effectively. That shows you that. You can see there's a dip for a year, then it goes back up. We've been able to extend it for a second year and data we're, we're currently submitting for publication uh, before it fades, but we need to find ways to embed it. We lose people in the United States pretty much every day. Um, when they leave inpatient units and emergency departments, we simply must do a better job of handling those care transitions. Uh, the science is absolutely sound. Two major studies have come out in the last two years. One is called ED Safe, another is called Safe Vet. What it's shown is that telephonic follow-up after these discharges is associated with reduced suicidal behavior. The issue here is that there's diffusion of responsibility between healthcare systems and the lack of financing mechanisms to have these very inexpensive but effective interventions implemented. And uh, safety planning is an intervention that's also now has randomized controlled trial evidence. These are just some of the resources that SAMHSA has available for free um, around suicide risk assessment. Let me just speak really briefly about the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. We answered over two million calls last year. Call volume continues to go up, um, but as call volume goes up, capacity is not going up. We rely on community crisis centers who need additional support um, in order to answer these really important calls. In most communities in America, it's the only thing available other than the emergency room in the middle of the night or even on a Sunday afternoon. SAMHSA has also been supporting enhanced crisis services. This is something called the Crisis Now model. Um, I won't go into detail, but think of it this way. We live in an era where 
a, you can track a package halfway around the world, but we routinely lose people within the lethal gaps of, cr of our crisis and emergency systems. Just last week, the President signed into law the National Suicide Prevention Hotline Improvement Act, which calls on SAMHSA, the VA, and the FCC to look at the potential for an N113 digit national mental health and emergency number, and we will be working on that over the next six months. So thank you very much. Thanks, and last but not least, Anand Parikh. Sarah, th thanks so much. Uh, I'm Anand Parikh, and Chief Medical Advisor at the Bipartisan Policy Center. It's terrific to be here, and I wanna, again, thank the Alliance and Commonwealth Fund, all of the terrific panelists, uh, and all of you for being here. Uh, I wanna just spend a couple of minutes um, echoing, I think, probably summarizing some of the key points, um, uh, and then helping us transition to, to the uh, discussion. I'm gonna probably take a step back, talk about life expectancy, uh, come back to deaths of despair and then really hone in on the, on the opioid epidemic. I think a, there are a lot of terrific points that have already been made. Hopefully I can underscore uh, some of them. Uh, so I think as David mentioned, uh, we are in a stretch, um, as, as the CDC tells us, of declining life expectancy in this country. We're, it's, it's been two years that we've been tracking, uh, 2015 and 2016. It, it may be that 2017 follows that stretch. Uh, this is pretty unprecedented. The last time there was declining life expectancy in the United States, it was 1993. The last time you had two years in a row was 1962 and 1963. The last time you had three years in a row was 100 years ago with the Spanish flu in 1918. Um, and so uh, these are unprecedented times. There's been a lot of literature uh, in the academic community trying to understand why life expectancy in this country is going down. And if I can just synthesize in 30 seconds all of that literature, if, if you were asked sort of a public health multiple choice question here, is declining life expectancy in the United States due to A, deaths of despair, B, obesity, or three, what we call the leveling off in the decreasing mortality from heart disease and cancer, some of the leading causes of death in this country? Uh, the answer is actually D. It's all of the above. Uh, a, so as David has explained to us, deaths of despair, it's the one category that is going uh, up in terms of, of mortality in this country that is being driven by, by drug uh, overdose deaths, which are being driven by the opioid use disorder and opioid overdose deaths, which is being driven by the illicit flow of opioids currently, particularly synthetics and, and fentanyl and precursors coming in from China. Uh, and it's really, if you look at, at, at much of the mortality figures, it's really fentanyl laced with heroin being sold as heroin and many other drugs are components of that right now. So unfortunately, the opioid epidemic in this country is gonna get worse before it gets better. We are seeing overall reductions in prescribing but until we see a commensurate de decrease in the illicit flow as well as treatment, which is absolutely critical, uh, we're not gonna see the decreases in overdose deaths that we'd like to see. Certainly alcohol has been talked about here, uh, 88,000 Americans by the CDC dying from alcohol, excessive alcohol use every year, costing a, a quarter of a trillion dollars in economic costs. This is an issue where there's evidence-based clinical and community uh, uh, services and practices that if we just employ, um, that we'd be able to reduce that. So here there's certainly a way we, we need to find the will. Uh, suicide, Richard has already covered suicide, 45,000 Americans dying from suicide deaths. Uh, the importance of focusing on youth, uh, focusing on early intervention uh, is, is absolutely critical. There are an array of risk factors we know about that we need to focus on. Firearm access is critical as well. Half of deaths involve uh, firearms. So, so all of these areas, deaths of despair are critical. Uh, obesity. It, now 40% of Americans in this country are, 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 are obese. Um, latest studies from, from January 2018 show that, uh, that, that obesity reduces life expectancy by about a year at the age of 40. Uh, and so I often say in, in, in a lot of talks that while uh, the opioid epidemic is the public health crisis of the decade, certainly the obesity epidemic is the public health crisis of the century for us. So we need to think about all of these um, epidemics. And thirdly, the leveling off and decreased mortality from heart disease and cancer is critical. Because if it was just deaths of despair increasing, then th those would be compensated by decreasing levels of heart disease and cancer. But we're seeing in many subpopulations actually a plateauing of deaths from heart disease and cancer. And that's also a critical reason for, for reductions in U.S. life expectancy. And I think th the other point to make is that all of these issues are interconnected. So for example, some of the risk factors driving obesity are the same risk factors driving heart disease and cancer. 
and many organizations like the Wellbeing Trust, a really influential philanthropy and nonprofit organization, remind us that, that even diseases of despair uh, make, it more, more, make it more difficult to prevent chronic diseases and manage chronic diseases. So all of these items are interconnected. And I think the second point on this slide is this, second, is this last bullet here. When it comes to health, the United States is far from being united. And this is a quote from, from an editorial that I co-authored in, in JAMA back in April, uh, looking at a recent study that Joe mentioned, this organization from the University of Washington, uh, the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. And they really focus on geographic disparities in the, in the United States, an area that we need to, I think, focus a lot more uh, um, about. And, and for example, life expectancy in this country, if you live in Hawaii, life expectancy is 81 years old. If you live in Mississippi, it's 74 year, years old. So if you live in Hawaii, you're right behind Ireland. If Hawaii were a country, you'd be about 20th in the world. Uh, Mississippi, if Mississippi were a country, you'd be about 76th in the world right, right, right after Kuwait. So there's, there's dramatic, as Joe said, zip code matters quite a bit. The study also showed that, that Americans aged 20 to 55, their mortality reversals over the last two, two decades in 21 states across the country, and they are driven by debts of despair. So it's cirrhosis, so alcohol is there, dr drug overdose, and self-harm. Uh, so all of these issues, I think we're, here, we're, we're seeing these issues play out. The, the research is demonstrating all of this. So all these state-level analyses are, are so important. Uh, to reiter reiterate some of the scorecard data that Dave alluded to, all these issues are important in every state, but certainly for Montana, it still might be suicide as, as a key public health issue. For New Mexico, it could be alcohol, and, and for West Virginia and New Hampshire, it, it could be opioid um, overdose. So I think looking, looking at individual states are so critical. And then th the last two, sort of two slides are, are really sort of placeholders for, I think, the, the discussion, in, and this is sort of wearing my, my former health and human services hat, I think there are tremendous opportunities at the federal level to better support um, states and localities with all of these deaths of despair. Take the example of opioids. There's tremendous work coming out of CDC and SAMHSA right now, um, uh, grants to state health departments. Marvin mentioned the STR and the SOR uh, uh, grants. These are critical investments to states to help them curb these epidemics. But I think we need to think even more about, about mandatory uh, spending and how to, how, to take, uh, how to take Medicare and Medicaid. Joe talked about Medicaid in the state of Arkansas. H how we make sure that our mandatory dollars go to tackle some of these important public health challenges. You know, I remember my time in Health and Human Services, I would often say that CMS was actually our most important public health agency. Because while, while, while many of our agencies are absolutely important, you know, they are, their budget runs in the several billion dollars, whether it's CDC or SAMHSA. Well, CMS has a trillion dollar budget, so we need to figure out how do you leverage our, our mandatory dollars, the, the, the unique levers that CMS has, whether it's payment policy, delivery models, waivers, state plan options, quality metrics, quality improvement organizations, coverage. There are a lot of unique levers that CMS has, that Medicaid has at the state level to really tackle some of our critical public health challenges. And the final slide is just a reminder, I think from the state perspective, so many opportunities November 2018, there'll be 36 gubernatorial elections. It doesn't mean 36 new governors, uh, but, but uh, 36 uh, elections. Uh, that will lead to either new agendas, new state health leaders, or updated um, agendas. Uh, and and uh, I think it's a critical time to have our state leaders focus on what I call the three Ps of population health, which are prevention, public health, and primary care. Just a quick note, uh, I think on, on primary care and why it's so important this has been alluded to in terms, in terms of, of treatment. So France in the 1990s ha had a significant opioid epidemic. It was really driven by heroin. Within four years, they were able to reduce opioid overdose deaths by 79%. How did they do it? They completely unleashed the entire primary care health system in that country. So all providers, all prescri could prescribe buprenorphine. And, and so dramatic reductions in opioid overdose deaths. So these are, there, are, there are public policy uh, policies that we have right now uh, that don't really allow our primary care providers, for example, uh, to, to prescribe medication-assisted treatment as easily as, 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 uh, as needed. There are caps. There are training requirements. So there are a lot of things that we can do in terms of learning from other countries. And the last point to make is, is just simply the importance of, of promoting bi-directional flow uh, between the federal government and states in terms of what we can learn on how to tackle these diseases. Uh, of despair. So one of the things that the Bipartisan Policy Center we're trying to do is track in the FY18 omnibus over $4 billion went are going uh, 
uh, to states to tackle the opioid epidemic. Where are these dollars going? Where are they flowing? Uh, for what purposes? How can we evaluate that? I think states have a tremendous um, opportunity to, to, to take all of these resources and evaluate what's working, what's not, through a feedback loop, um, uh, inform the federal government, Congress, and the executive branch um, as, as, not, as all of these challenges are going to be with us for, uh, for some time. So I think that feedback loop is, is absolutely critical. So uh, hopefully a, a couple of, of points uh, just to highlight, and, and Sarah, I'll turn it back to you for uh, the start of the discussion. Thank you all so much. Uh, so it's time to ask questions. You can um, come up to either Mike on um, either side of the room, um, write a question on a green card, and someone from the Alliance will um, bring it up. Um, and you can also submit a question by Twitter at um, hashtag AllHealthLive. Let me um, kick it off um, really quickly, and then um, we'll turn to, to um, the mic. You know, a number of you mentioned the need for multidisciplinary efforts to address these so-called deaths of despair, um, including in areas outside of um, the health systems. And I want to ask, just from a real-life perspective, you know, what does it really take to make these successful, and um, are they sustainable? And, and um, perhaps um, I'll just open it up to anyone who wants to jump in. Joe? I'll start off. Yeah, I think recognizing, and this is in the role that I played for, for both governors, starting a conversation, but recognizing as you start that conversation, you may be using very different language. Our criminal justice system, our health care system, our public health system, uh, our school system, our foster care system, they may be talking about the impact of opioids on a family in a community but they will use very different language in the discussion. So I think having an honest table that you can start the discussion, because if you can get the discussion going, and if you can define the, the, the words that people use, the threat is real for all of the different perspectives, and that will naturally draw people together to look for opportunities that have an impact. Yeah, so what, what I would say is that a really critical issue in terms of suicide prevention is that Suicide prevention requires a coordinated, multi-sectoral response in order to be effective. And that's part of what makes it challenging, because it can't just live in the mental health or the Department of Health or somewhere else. So it, it needs to have a, a strong focus. Colorado, for example, has a, uh, established a state suicide prevention commission that has um, brought together various parts of state government because you need to have involved, you need mental health, you need the Department of Health, you need substance abuse, you need veterans affairs, you need um, uh, education, you need the justice system. All of these need to play their roles and someone has to convene them, right? And they use, need to use the, the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention as a blueprint for doing that. But it doesn't come easily. If you're not structured to do that, there. the Tennessee, for example, has a six-person office of suicide prevention and crisis intervention, but in some states, um, you have one state suicide prevention coordinator who may have one part of, of a full-time equivalent devoted to this issue. It's not enough to get it done. I'll just add that it's also difficult. I mean, the ability to collaborate across secretariats is, is usually a challenge. Um, and it requires a level of intentionality that sometimes is not there. Um, and so the governor has to establish it as a priority. Um, I think additionally, when you look at a, a, a place like Virginia, there's a lot of um, counties have a lot of power. Um, and counties, depending on where you are, have different resources to bear. And so you also have those disparities with, say, Wise County versus Arlington County. And so how do you create a level playing field where everyone can bring their resources while at the same time the state supports those local efforts? Thank you. OK, we have people lined up at the mic. So if you could just introduce yourself and ask your question. Um, I'll start over here. Okay, my name is Mary Carrick. I, I was looking at over at states, and all these regions are rural, people with not very high education levels, and except for probably some of the states in the Southwest that have Indian reservations on them that have historically had a big problem with substance and alcohol abuse, they're overwhelmingly white. And has any of these studies made a connection to American manufacturing jobs being sent overseas, usually to third world or close to third world countries, and also the 11 plus million illegal aliens that are currently in this country. 
and get hired to do a lot, the few jobs that are left, you know, without having to have minimum wage laws, OSHA requirements. And the other question I've had is the term opioid. What percentage of these opioids are illegal street drugs and what percentage are being prescribed by doctors? And is there any pushback from the pharmaceutical industry in the case of the legal opioids? Because they're making a lot of money off of this. All right, so two um, kind of different questions. One is kind of, are any of the studies looking at some of the causes of um, economic distress uh, that, that, that may be driving some of these trends? So, so I'm not aware of studies specifically looking at manufacturing uh, exits, but I think you will see a correlation. And again, I think we need to be careful of causation, but there is, I think, gonna be a correlation in many of these areas that are economically challenged and distressed. You're also gonna see those are the areas each uh, census report that have out-migration of their population because they have fewer opportunities. Uh, and it, it's whether it's Kentucky, whether it's Arkansas, Mississippi, uh, uh, the upper uh, mountainous regions. Uh, I think you're gonna see a correlation of opportunity go right with uh, some of the issues around the addictions and the deaths of despair that we're talking about. David, did you want to? Um, you know, it's interesting. Again, just to, to echo what Joe said, the the original work on, on deaths of despair and by the two economists, uh, Angus and, and uh, Ann Case and, and Angus Deaton, um, they were looking at deaths of despair as sort of an outcome of, uh, of a health outcome uh, that was sort of happening as sort of economic and, and social trends were changing. If you read some of their work, they are actually careful not to tie it too closely to to sort of the level of income that you have, so much as it's the amount of opportunity that you have. Um, it's it's not necessarily the well. It's not necessarily that these deaths of despair are are always high in low income areas, um, but as as sort of that social fabric starts to break down, as as your sense of opportunity starts to go away, that's where you know, in case sort of say the, the deaths of despair start to really, really shoot up. Anand and, and Marvin. Hey, I'll, I'll just echo sort of Joe and David. I, I think Case and Deaton, when they initially came up with the deaths of despair, they were looking at a uh, particularly um, specific population, you know, um, uh, so white non-Hispanic um, Americans age 45 to 54 with less than, than, than a college education, so high school diploma or, or less. and. Uh, and I think the opportunity frame um, is, is sort of a better frame, uh, the need to increase opportunity for, uh, for those vulnerable Americans. Um, so they are not, uh, they don't uh, uh, really uh, fall into addiction um, or uh, are not predisposed to, to some of these diseases of, of despair, I think is critical. And to your second, uh, second question, um, we are seeing sort of prescribing slowly start to nationally uh, come down, we're, we're under, 200 million prescriptions for the first time in a long time, which is still absolutely uh, astro uh, um, astronomical. Uh, but it is really the illicit flow that is driving the epidemic right now. And you mentioned pharmaceutical companies. In fact, there are n a number of states and, and local jurisdictions that are now suing pharmaceutical companies. In fact, President Trump asked his attorney general just, just earlier this week um, uh, about doing, doing something similar. So there's a lot of right now um, uh, focus, in, focus on prescription drug companies, uh, and also sort of what they can do to, to curb the epidemic as well. Marvin, did you wanna? Well, on, only that when you look at the data, um, the African-American mortality rate in Virginia continues to be stubbornly high. And while we have to, you know, we're focusing on the death of despair, we have to think about what those deaths are telling us. We cannot, it cannot be to the detriment of other populations. And so that's why I think the opportunity and the health opportunity index uh, kind of frames the conversation well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, you've been waiting patiently. Can you please um, yes. introduce yourself and ask your question? Yes, I'm Bob Rosenblatt with the helpwithaging.com website. I've been following this on Twitter and have seen an increasing number of comments from people who say, I have a chronic health condition, I've been taking opioids for a long time, and my doctor just cut me off because he's afraid of getting in trouble with the state or federal government. And I've also seen similar comments by a number of physicians saying exactly the same thing. 
we have these patients, they need this, but we're not sure what to do now. So what, if any, advice, suggestions should be given to these doctors and patients? And before you answer, thank you for your question. Before you answer, I, there's a related question on a green card, so I just want to try to combine them. Um, and it relates to um, this question of chronic pain. Um, and, um, and to your question, there's, um, the, the questioner asks, is the CMS rule on limiting opioid prescriptions to 90 milligrams per day the correct policy to work towards lowering opioid substance abuse? So getting towards the question around prescribing patterns and then how to manage chronic pain and um, perhaps are there alternative chronic pain um, treatment um, options that might work. I'll rush back and tell you. <laughs> Let me, let me start, and I think this is where it is important for us to evolve the discussion. We have nascent first-time users for which we have overprescribed and for which we now know that if you're using between three and five days, that's when you become addicted. We have a decade and a half ago in emergency rooms and hospitals and clinics across the nation, we had a pain scale that if you had any pain, there was a, a marketing effort to try to treat. So we have a number of people who I would say are dependent. To get through the day, they have to have a narcotic of some type. The effort to squeeze the supply on physicians needs to anticipate reactions by both of those two groups. The first group, the nascent group, will not have much of an effect other than not becoming addicted because of seven-day, five-day limits and, and limits on the amount of morphine milliequivalents. The second group, the addicted group, if we don't ramp up the treatment, if we don't have more physicians that are actively engaged in assisting people to withdraw from their dependency, those individuals are at risk to turning to the illicit market. And I think that's where we do have the potential uh, to drive individuals by only focusing on the supply and not on the treatment uh, to potentially, as, as Anand said, we may have higher death rates in the coming years. Uh, I'll just add that um, there are millions of Americans suffering from chronic pain uh, in this country, and, and some absolutely need um, uh, opioids, and we have to make sure that any of our policies don't have the unintended co consequences of, 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 of increasing more chronic pain. That being said, I, th I think uh, many of the policies, even the prescribing guidelines that CDC put out there, have, have not um, uh, been interpreted correctly. So there's a lot more education that we need to do uh, to ensure uh, th that, that individuals who need these medications uh, have the ability to stay on these medications, that physicians uh, and healthcare professionals uh, are, aren't, aren't scared off, for example, of, of being able to, to prescribe these medications. So I think, uh, I think we need to examine sort of state policies, correct them where, where there's an overreach, ensure that, prescribe, that, that there's more education about the important prescribing guidelines, which I think are very important. Uh, just a quick note to, to Sarah's question. Uh, and to a question to Sarah about, about what CMS is doing. So starting in, in 2019, uh, Part D plans for CMS beneficiaries, um, uh, whenever somebody um, is on a regimen with more than sort of 90 milli equivalents, it's not that they can't get any more. It, it's simply so, sort of the, that, the, that the pharmacist has, has, to, has to call the, the, the healthcare professional to verify the dosage. There, there will be a new seven-day limit for first-time acute chronic pain episodes, and many states have, have, have already done that. So uh, I think we just have to make sure that our policies are evidence-based, but then communicated very well. And I don't think we've done a really good job on communicating these and educating healthcare professionals and, and patients. Okay, and speaking of communication, was that in Part B or Part D that you said? Uh, sorry, Part D. D as in David. David. All right, um, you've been very patient. Introduce yourself and ask your question. I'm Rita Kavahara. I'm a policy fellow with the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations and also a physician in training. My question is regarding um, addressing the infectious disease consequences of the opioid epidemic. And um, my focus right now has been on viral hepatitis, particularly hepatitis B as well as C. I think when we're looking at the opioid epidemic, it's important to address the immediate health consequences, like ensuring naloxone availability, ensuring patients have access to um, support programs to help address their addiction. But I think we need to make sure that we don't get so short-sighted and um, forget to address uh, preventable infectious diseases like hepatitis B, which has a vaccine. 
um, that's very effective, but only a quarter of adults are currently vaccinated against hepatitis B, and we've seen rises of up to 400% of hepatitis B cases in certain states. And then hepatitis C, where there's no vaccine, but there is a cure where we can completely treat and cure people of hepatitis C, and there have been significant rises in hepatitis C across the country. And so what is being done at the state and federal levels to address this and um, ensure that we're looking at this from a public health perspective um, more broadly to prevent something like the HIV epidemic in the 1980s, which exploded into what it is today, um, from happening um, in hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Well, I think one state that I would refer you to is Delaware, and they piloted syringe exchange programs, for example, and then, and then they, they expanded that statewide and saw reductions essentially in, in infectious disease transmission, HIV and hepatitis C. Um, Vice President Pence and Surgeon General Adams saw the same thing in Scott County, Indiana, when they were previously in Indiana, and had to, had to um, essentially install an evidence-based syringe exchange program. So I think you're getting at sort of harm reduction and how do we make sure that, that through the lens of the opioid epidemic, uh, we're also able to, to tackle some of these comorbidities. And certainly with injectable opioids, the risk of transmission of infectious diseases like HIV and hepatitis are there. We need to look at evidence-based um, harm reduction programs like syringe exchange programs to see uh, how they work, if, uh, when they work, and, and, and when they do uh, implement them. And I think another part of this is how do we um, bridge the silos that exist. So for example, at CDC, there's the division of viral hepatitis, then there's immunization services, um, and those, div those divisions often have separate streams of funding. And this goes across the board when you're looking at um, issues of addiction, and then how do you uh, transfer some of that money so that you're looking at things comprehensively. So, so I think you're, you're question is spot on, and I just want to expand it a little bit, building off of Marvin's comments a few minutes ago. It is rare that you have the focus, the energy, the new money going into the health system, and in part, it's because this is the sexy topic right now. We need to make sure that our focus in this topic doesn't fail to recognize the disparities that are still present and in some places growing or the other conditions, you're saying there's, it's almost like throwing a pebble in the pool. We're focused on where the pebble landed, that's the opioids, but outside that ring are infectious diseases, your interests, adverse childhood events when a parent is uh, incapacitated by drugs, and the rings go out from that. As a nation, and hopefully in your everyday opportunities, there'll be a way to say, let's look at the whole pond of health, not just where the opioids landing, or where the pebble's landing because of the opioid focus today. If I can just make one comment regarding the um, issue of that kind of ripple uh, effect. Um, when we had Case and Deaton come to visit us, we also had uh, Robert Bosart, who was for years was the VA's uh, main data guy on, on suicide. And, um, and he told us that there are counties in West Virginia where 40% of the kids are either in foster care or under the protective of child, protection of Child Protective Services. And then I was further told by the West Virginia State Suicide Prevention Coordinator that you know, there's one county where that number is 60%. And she expressed concern about, in years to come, you know, what will happen to those kids? What will happen in terms of their suicide rates? What will happen in terms of a range of other uh, uh, really negative outcomes. So I think it's very, very important that we're aware of those, of those uh, ripple effects. And um, each death, by, whether it's suicide or accidental uh, opioid overdose, affects many other individuals and brings its own intense pain with it that, ha that has a ripple effect that we need to pay attention to. In Virginia, we're working to establish harm reduction sites. Um, one thing to, to recognize, and I don't think sometimes this is truly appreciated is how difficult they are to set up and how much uh, local buy-in you need in order to be able to not only stand it up but also maintain um, those sites. And so even a, a locality where you have a high prevalence of infectious diseases as a result of substance abuse will say, we don't want that here. 
And so it is, part of it is kind of making sure that the state prioritizes it, but working with those localities to set them up and also sustain them. Can you just say um, just a little bit more what about a harm reduction site? Like what, is in, what does that entail? I mean, the one that folks often cite is syringe exchanges. So, you know, in some places, especially where we see, again, a high prevalence of these infectious diseases tend to be more conservative. And so how do you work with uh, the health department in that locality? How do you work with the sheriff? How do you work with the local electeds to set up this program? Um, usually what you'll get, you'll get some pushback from law enforcement. Um, we are seeing more collaboration between law enforcement and health and human resources, um, in large part because of those working groups that we've established. But nonetheless, these things are hard, hard to set up. Okay, we'll get to your question now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Duff. I'm from Congressional Research Service. Um, so I've heard uh, some conversation about hypotheses as to why uh, such an increase over the past decade. And it seems like economic opportunity has been cited and, and certainly uh, the influx of opioids has been well documented, although I don't know that that explains all of it. But I'm curious about hypotheses in the context of prevention. So even if you were to prevent some of these deaths of despair, you're still talking about potentially a lifetime of care for some of these people, whether it's substance abuse treatment or mental health treatment. So I'm curious about examples, either ideas that you have uh, or specific examples where you're actually addressing the underlying causes of some of the symptoms or, or some of the issues that result in these deaths. While you're thinking about that, I'm gonna throw another one at you, which is a related question. Um, uh, someone asked, um, what are some of the most burdensome laws and regulations preventing more providers from uh, being wavered to uh, dispense buprenorphine? buprenorphine? So I don't wanna necessarily target the answers just on buprenorphine, uh, but um, it's a related question, so thanks. So, so if I can try to tackle, I, I don't want it to be represented that opportunity and, and the presence of opioids are the primary causes. I think, and this is the basis for many, much of the litigation against the pharmaceutical companies, I think there were some false advertising um, practices that occurred over the last decade and a half. I think as physicians, we didn't recognize the addiction potential of some of the uh, prescriptions that, uh, or many of the prescriptions that, that went forth. I think our understanding of that is growing so that it's now known uh, and, and fairly solidly shown that it's the three to five day window uh, that if you are using a narcotic for three to five days that your addiction potential doubles uh, and at seven even goes higher. So I think there are practices on the medical side as well as the supply side uh, that have to be directly affected. Now that's not getting over into the illicit drug issues or uh, uh, some of the more uh, uh, non-healthcare activities, but I think this is a whole package. Uh, it, it's susceptibility of individuals, it's exposure with lack of knowledge by uh, uh, medical personnel, and then it's some of the uh, lack of understanding of how dangerous these drugs are at initiation. Uh, uh, let me mention this from the perspective of suicide prevention. The, I think the suicide prevention field, and I would count myself among them, has really done an inadequate job of provi uh, providing coherent explanations for the increase in suicide in the United States. We know it's not only, I mean, certainly it's not only about the Great Recession because it was already going up uh, before that. The Great Recession may have exacerbated some of, uh, you know, some of those trends. You know, so there's a real need to understand better these trajectories over time. Case and Deaton talk about what the cumulative disadvantage. Um, and the, I think the, the notion is that these things, you know, may come together. You know, so um, you lose your job. But thankfully, most people who lose their job don't kill themselves. So, so what is it that's going on? Well, it may be something like, you lose your job, but you're living in an area where there are not a lot of other jobs to get to. And here's the key point that Case and Deaton make. You're not college educated, you're not mobile, and you don't have the wherewithal to go to other places to pursue economic opportunity. So you are staying in your community that has fewer opportunities. You start to get depressed, you start to drink, 
Maybe if you, you were doing hard labor and you were injured and you got prescribed an opioid, and that these things come together and build on each other and, and begin to put uh, people at increased risk. But we need to understand these trajectories better including among youth and being able to intervene earlier to try to alter these trajectories over time. Now, while most of the suicides take place among adults, so it's really important to pay attention to them. On the other hand, if we can alter these trajectories earlier on, um, then uh, we may has, there may be many years of, of life saved for many people if we can learn to intervene more effectively. Very briefly, just b build upon what Richard said and, and sort of echo his comments. I think this really speaks to the importance of improving children's health policy in this mm. country uh, and adverse child experiences. And a lot of these diseases of despair um, start in an early age, whether it's, it's alcohol um, access and bin drinking and, and high school and college, whether uh, Richard show you, showed you for suicide, leading uh, uh, second leading cause of death, particularly for, for, for young persons. Uh, the opioid epidemic for those who are on, on heroin it's laced with, with, with fentanyl and, and other opioids. So I, I think we need to do a, a much better job focusing on policies from a prevention perspective, since that's what the question was about, starting early um, in life and making sure we get the policies right, get, the, get people on the right trajectory. Um, um, so later in life, uh, they're not actually dying from these uh, diseases of despair. Marvin? And, and I think that we fully don't understand the issue. I think up until recently, you started mm -hmm. to see even addiction being called a disease. Um, and as a, from the state level, before we dealt with these kind of situations through the justice system, and now you're starting to see treatment. And so we are at a, at a critical time where we are evolving as to how we react to, to the situation, but are we fully there? I would say that we are not. Great, thank you. Um, so th there was a, a specific question, actually, just I'm um, following on the point about children and children in foster care. Um, can you expand on the impact of um, opioid use disorder or substance use disorder on children in the child welfare system, um, specifically in foster care? And do you think that the recent rise um, of children in the foster care system can be completely attributed to the rise of drug-related um, deaths or um, use of drugs, um, or is there some other cause? And then um, talk more about what can be done to make sure that these um, kids can um, have uh, some more resources to live a more uh, a healthier life and, and be in more of a state of well-being. So briefly, and, and others may, I'll, I'll try to be targeted in the response here. You know, the, the state or the county or the municipality has got legal obligations uh, to safeguard the children in those uh, uh, geopolitical areas. And when the parents are addicted and potentially incapacitated because of drug use or other issues, the state or the, the, the uh, political entity has to step in. I don't think there's any way that foster care has been taken over by uh, substance abuse. We've had long-term issues of, of uh, uh, parental challenges with, with children, but clearly in certain areas where we have high drug use, you see a correlation with much higher uh, uh, requirements. And those requirements then spill over to drain the personnel, the parents, the other families that are willing to serve as caretakers for children that are under protective custody or that need a, a safe environment and financial resources. And so it really does end up, the ripple effect is a negative ripple effect, if you will, across a state or a municipality's ability to respond and safeguard those that are most vulnerable. Tate Heuer with the American Academy of PAs, our physician assistants. I want to bring up a recent quote from Dr. Atul Gawande. Imagine a cure for cancer deaths, that it, that is op but not using it, and that that is opioid addiction. Um, MAT is 80%, including buprenorphine, is 80% effective in reducing deaths for those who are addicted. There has been a major effort to increase wavered providers, although it has had limited success. In 2006, Congress created a five-year program for nurse practitioners and PAs that are increasingly primary care providers in the country to be able to provi provide MAT services, buprenorphine, 
and that, that it's a, it was limited to a five-year program because there's a, um, a cost to about 40% of people who are addicted are on Medicaid, so there is a mandatory health care cost to making a policy like that permanent. We have made free training available to PAs across the country to get a waiver, and we have really heard heartwarming stories from our providers who have earned a waiver and are providing those services. However, there, there is, it's a slower take up than we would like to see. And my question is, as um, b both Joe Thompson and Marvin mentioned, increasing wavered providers in states. And I just think we, we know that this works. And what can we do to coordinate federal and state efforts to have more wavered providers out there? We're working to make the waiver permanent. The House opioid le legislation that recently pa passed would have done that. The um, Senate bills that went through committee currently do not do it, and it has to do with a CBO score issue. I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. So, so for the broader group, just to some of that may have sounded a little mumbo jumbo, and, and, and Tate's been on the health efforts for, for decades. As a physician, I have a DEA number that allows me to prescribe. Uh, however, there are restrictions on my DEA number for certain substances, methadone and, and buprenorphine uh, specifically. The waiver allows me to be able to prescribe those, and the DEA puts a cap on the number of individuals, 30 I think it is, in my first year that I have a waiver. Uh, so it is, a, it is an effort by either physicians, nurse practitioners, or physician assistants to go through to be able to medically assist individuals to withdraw from their narcotic addiction. Uh, I think the earlier question, too many physicians just say, well, I just won't prescribe them anymore, as opposed to going through this effort to try to be able to be supportive of their patients who have an addiction. Um, so I think, Tate, to your question, uh, we've got to figure out how on the education side to our clinical providers, we emphasize the importance of their willingness to treat individuals that have addiction and then on the regulatory side that we put systems in place that allow a more rapid expansion of support given the threat that we have across the nation. Yeah, well you have a lot of individuals who are waiver that are not prescribing. And so part of the STR grant um, that, we'll, that we are applying for includes a hotline. Uh, so that if a prescriber has a question about can I use it, can I prescribe in this situation or that situation, they'll be able to have that, that question answered. I think this, the second piece of that is that the MAT is really important, but also the, tri the treatment piece. Uh, the reason why our, our arts program has been particularly successful is because you have to create the conditions uh, by which you, cre you have treatment services, and reimbursement usually drives what treatment services are available or what not, and so those reimbursements are really important in this conversation. If I could just add, I think, and also state scope of practice laws, particularly for NPs and PAs, and whether they can prescribe buprenorphine is important, but. I don't think our federal public policy, and I think the legislation in Congress right now is a lot of good things, but it doesn't address this, these fundamental issues. There are still barriers. Why, why do we need waivers? Why are there caps? Can you imagine if we said, um, healthcare professional, you can only take care of 30 diabetics in your patient, in your, in your practice. You can only take care of 100 patients with heart disease. We don't do that for any other chronic disease. We further stigmatize this issue and reduce the capacity we need uh, to treat individuals with opioid addiction. A waiver, why should an NP or PA have to go through 24 hours of training? This is not co more complicated than many other things that healthcare professionals do. We treat complex diabetics, we, 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 we manage insulin regimens. This is not that complicated. There is no reason there ought to be an eight hour training requirement for physicians and a 24 hour training requirement for NPs and PAs. Until, and it's really Congress, until we can fundamentally tackle some of these public policy issues, um, and expand capacity, caps and waivers, and also we're not going to see the commensurate increase in treatment. And so that's one thing uh, I hope Congress takes a look at before um, the ultimate package moves forward. So we have one more person at the mic, so I think we have time for one more live question, um, and then we'll close. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Garrett Moran. I'm a vice president at Westat and direct the ARC Academy for Integrating Behavioral Health and Primary Care. We've been doing a lot of work on opioid issues. I was going to make a couple of the statements that the panel has already. There are many more doctors who have the waivers than who are actively prescribing. 30% of docs get the waiver and never do anything with it. 
Uh, the median number of, of patients treated is something like five. It's, it's very small. Uh, and, and a key issue here is the stigma. And the patients have stigma and shame about this disease. Our communities have stigma. Our providers have stigma. They don't want to deal with this population. And a fundamental thing we've got to address is the stigma around this disorder. Uh, the other thing, we've, we've, I've been doing a study where I visited a number of programs around the country over the past few months, and in, going beyond the prescribers, we're finding a real shortage of behavioral health professionals to work with these patients. Uh, probably 80 or 90 percent of them have trauma. Uh, half of them have serious depression. Uh, the rate of opioid prescription to people with mental disorders is just sky high. About half of all opioid prescriptions are going to people with mental health disorders. And it's not enough. Medication-assisted treatment is absolutely essential, but it does take uh, behavior, solid behavioral health services to do that. We've been looking around the programs around the country. There is no clear standard for what that should look like now. And uh, there are some really good programs, but um, it's an area that many programs are struggling with, and they're struggling finding professionals with the willingness and the training to work with this population. I'd like your reaction to those observations. I think your, your observations are, are on target and probably exacerbated in areas that we have health care provider shortages. Even, I mean, mental health is usually the one that has the most shortage uh, when you start looking at, at shortage areas. Um, I would say, and I think this is on this opportunity in some of the value-based purchasing, when, when we put in a pretty assertive patient-centered medical home and told the primary care providers, we will share 50 percent of the savings with you, one of the first things they turned to was bringing a mental health provider into the primary care space. Uh, the alignment of financial incentives in the primary care space to reinforce and reward integration of mental and physical health works. We need to do more of that so that we can accelerate the transitions. Great, thank you. Okay, we're, um, we've got a few minutes left and um, we're gonna wrap up. I'm gonna ask each of you um, a final question. And um, these are difficult topics and despair is a really strong word. Um, and I think we have examined some of the reasons why um, this is going on. Um, but, but what I wanna ask is, you know, and, and we're going to just go down the line, so I'm going to put each of you on the spot. What gives each of you hope for progress on this issue going forward? Give you a minute to think about it. While they're thinking about it, you all have blue evaluation forms in your folders. If you could fill one out before you leave, that would be appreciated. Thank you. All right, so what gives you hope, David? Um, so I think what gives me hope is, like, like, like we've said, zip code matters, and We've pr there are places in the country where the problem isn't as bad as, as in other places in the country. That tells me a couple of things. It tells me that there's an opportunity to learn from those places. Um, and so I think what gives me hope is the fact that when we look around, that not everybody has the same experience. There's different experiences. And let's try to figure out how to take some lessons from those places with the, with the more positive or the, the less bad experiences, at least, and, and translate that into... Um, into you know new care models, new payment models, whatever, um, so that you know we can sort of you know you know float the boat, uh, rise the level for everybody else. Uh, I think what what gives me hope is that I think Virginia is taking this opportunity to examine the inequalities that exist within our Commonwealth, and you for the first time you have uh, other individuals that otherwise wouldn't talk to one another at the same table trying to discuss the issue because it impacts populate every population across the board. And so public safety is talking to health, labor is talking to employers to figure out how we move forward together. And so for me, the way ahead is the fact that at this point in time, we're all in the same situation. We have to figure out how to work together. Okay, what, what I would say, first off, is that uh, despair is a strong word, but it's an important word. And I think it's what unites all of these kinds of deaths. And in America, no one should have to die alone and in despair. So, what we can do, so we need to, con what gives me hope is that we are continuing to ramp up our efforts. We are not there uh, yet, but 
We know more about suicide prevention than ever before. We know a lot about what works. We have examples of programs and, and uh, approaches that have demonstrated reductions in suicide attempts and deaths. And the challenges in many ways is to bring what we already know to scale. So the fact that we know that it can be done is what gives me hope. Uh, I'll say similarly, there are evidence-based interventions in the clinical setting and the community setting uh, to tackle each and every one of these conditions of, of despair. We don't know everything. We need to learn more, but there are evidence-based interventions. We need to have the will to implement these interventions. And I think the best way also to, to tackle stigma is to educate and communicate and talk about these issues. And, and I want to, again, thank the Commonwealth and the Alliance for actually, these aren't uplifting topics, but they're, they absolutely need to be the focus of, of discussion, because if we don't, that further stigmatizes these conditions. So, so I would say despair is a strong but appropriate word. Uh, the synonym that you could put there is loss, states of loss, because people are losing family members, community members each and every day from these several specific causes. What gives me hope, and it's the second part of the title, is that I think there is motivation and awareness that we have statistics now showing our life expectancy is decreasing. It is unlikely we're gonna have a magic pill or a surgical procedure or some healthcare intervention that's gonna solve this. And so we're moving upstream to try to figure out how we have our communities be a healthy place to raise our children and to experience our lives. And I think that's a new, that's a new paradigm. Uh, you know, some call it the social determinants of health. I can't make that work with my policymakers. They, they, they glaze over. That's why I went to zip code risk. I can get there with zip code risk. Uh, and in my community, two miles makes a difference in terms of what you're offered in the grocery store, in terms of what you have available to you in terms of uh, safety, in terms of what you have available to you in terms of transportation, in terms of what you have available to you for jobs or educational outcomes. Uh, and I think we're gonna recognize that that life expectancy number is gonna continue to go in the wrong direction until we pull together, as this full room indicates, and we start addressing what's causing those states of despair and states of loss. Thank you all so much. And on that note, I wanna thank everybody for being here to learn with us and hope that um, perhaps you'll take a moment to think about what, what gives you hope and um, what is something you would like to work on related to, um, to these very, very important issues um, for our fellow Americans. So thank you to our panel. Thank you to the Commonwealth Fund um, for their support. Um, and I hope everyone has a great afternoon. <laughs>